Hi, everybody. Welcome to the International Water Resources Association webinar, Water Challenges for Oceania, today to 2025. Um, we're really glad to have you with us today, if you're from the Oceania region or from all over the world. And um, we're going to go ahead and get the event started in just one or two minutes. We're going to give everyone a chance to get a last cup of coffee uh, or glass of water or whatever. Uh, and uh, everyone, just, uh, hold with us for one second, and we'll be with you soon. Thank you for joining us. How everyone is joining us. Uh, this is the International Water Resources Association webinar on water challenges of Oceania to date 2025. And uh, we will be getting started in just one minute. So uh, please make any last minute preparations you need on your side and we will be starting in just a second. Thank you. Okay, I think this is, we've got enough time for everyone who's running late to get with us today. And, uh, uh, so I just want to welcome everyone here today to the International Water Resources webinar, Water Challenges of Oceania today to 2025. We're really excited to have everyone join us today. This is our first webinar featuring the work from our regional uh, geographic chapters. Um, so we're really excited to see what Oceania has to tell us and talk to us about today and kind of plot out their trajectory for the next few years um, and the work they're doing. We have some great panelists joining us here today. Um, you can see on your screen, we have uh, Dr. Andrew Dance, the chair of the IWA Oceana chapter and program manager at the University of South Wales Global Water Institute. We have uh, Dr. Amelia Tabrucci, the head of department epidemiology and environmental health, Child Health Research Center, University of Queensland. Uh, uh, professor Paul Jangles, Honorary Professor of Integrated Environmental Health, Child Health Research Center, uh, School of Public Health, University of Queensland as well. Uh, Dave Heavyweight from the Water Governance Coordinator from the Pacific Community. And Associate Professor Lucy uh, Marshall, Deputy Director, Water Research Center, School of Civic and Environmental Engineering, University of New South Wales. So. Um, just to remind everyone, this is a webinar hosted by the International Water Resources Association. The IWA is an international network of researchers and practitioners who work on a multidisciplinary range of water resource issues, which I think you're really going to see highlighted today by our panel, bringing a lot of different viewpoints and backgrounds and research methods into the work they're doing. Um, and we are a nonprofit, non-governmental educational organization. Uh, IWA provides a global knowledge-based forum just like this one, for bridging disciplines and geographies by connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations, and institutions, everyone who's concerned about the sustainable use of our world's water resources. 
We're really happy to have you here in the audience. Uh, thank you for tuning in with us today. Um, like I said, we have this panel of both practitioners and researchers who have been really active in the Oceania region for many years, a real depth of knowledge, uh, regional expertise. Um, and, but as many of you have noticed and realized, uh, most of our webinars are based on special issues of our flagship uh, publication, Water International. This is not. Um, this is a special event to highlight the work coming from our Oceania Regional Chapter. Um, and we have a number of regional chapters around the world, including in China, India, Japan. Um, so if you are from a different region and this event piques some interest, then maybe you should contact us and set up a regional chapter in where you're from. Uh, as be able to bring water professionals and people who are interested in uh, these issues together in your area and you, you can feature your work and provide networking and provide support services uh, to help you uh, advance your uh, missions. So we're really excited to see what Oceana has to say, uh, say with us today. Um, a lot of the urgent water challenges they're going to discuss uh, are included being prepared for climate change, uh, community adaptation, and trying to balance between the human and environmental needs. Um, and we're going to try to engage some sustainable questions around water resource management, um, which is going to be a theme of our upcoming IWA World Water Congress in Daegu, South Korea. So we're really excited to kind of set this path and trajectory um, for the next couple of years. Um, so um, finally, if you hear the things that today that are really exciting to you, please tune into our LinkedIn webpage and um, we can continue the discussion and continue the uh, process there after the event. Um, as many of you know, what we're going to do is record this, put it on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube, our, our YouTube channel, as well as on our website. So you can go to either and watch a recording because I'm sure it'll be outstanding and you'll want to watch several times. Um, and we um, will also have the PDFs of our presentations. So if you want to go back and, and, and see a presentation, um, just give us a few days. Go to our website, www.iwra.org, and you'll find us there. So um, just to briefly explain the format of today's webinar, um, to start with, each of our panelists will give a short presentation. Um, and then at the end of the event, we'll have time for audience questions. So if you have a question you want to ask, either for just a single panelist or for the group, kind of engaging across different presentations, uh, just go ahead and send it in. You'll see in the GoToWebinar um, panel, control panel there on your uh, well, on, on the side of your screen, it'll say questions about halfway, two thirds of the way down. Just go ahead and click that. And if you type the question, I'll see it. And then at the end, I can direct it to the appropriate person. Um, so uh, we appreciate you understand, you know, we can't get to every question, but we're gonna do our best. So with that in mind, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Dr. Andrew Dancy. Thank you very much, Scott. Just wait for my uh, screen share to come up. Here we are. Yeah, there you go. You got it. Uh, is it full screen in presentation mode? We're getting there. Give it a second to load here. There we go. We see that we see your screen. Just um, need to get it into. Okay, it should be good to go. Is it full screen and presentation mode for the audience and yourselves? Uh, not. Quite, but you know, uh, just as we practiced earlier, it might just be taking a second. Um, uh, yes, apologies to the audience. It looks like my Wi-Fi is a bit slow to slow to catch up, but um, it, should, it should come along there. Um, but perhaps I'll start and, uh, and Scott, if it hey, doesn't guys. switch over, please. There we are. Okay, that sounds good. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much for having us, and it's my pleasure to be involved in this webinar. Um, as a representative from the UNSW Global Water Institute, um, as you said, which is chairing the newest geographic chapter of IWRA, the Oceana chapter. <clears throat> the IWRA um, Oceana chapter um, hosted here at UNSW um, is, came from the World Water Congress in June 2017. The MOU was signed and UNSW was the perfect place to host this 
Um, one of the reasons being the breadth of um, experience that we have here and the Global Water Institute um, spanning across 13 research centres and institutes at the university, with over 400 um, water researchers. Um, the water challenges between today and 2025 is something that uh, also aligns well with their university's 2025 strategy. <clears throat> and as you mentioned, Scott, because we're also the newest um, geographic chapter and the first one in the Southern Hemisphere, we're doing things backwards. Uh, we're going to start with this webinar and um, hear from our expert panellists um, today and as well as the audience participation and from that we're going to develop um, a draft uh, policy brief um, as part of the RWRA series uh, and then use that to develop a um, uh, contents list for the um, special issue of a Water International Journal planned to be um, published in late 2019 and this is then going to feed into the 17th um, IWRA Congress, which will be held in Daegu in Korea uh, in 2020. So that gives the audience um, a bit of idea of um, uh, the direction we're heading. And we very much look forward to your input and your questions and pulling up things that we may not have touched on that you think um, is important to be included in this process. There's a second thing that comes out of this webinar. And that will also be the inaugural um, Oceana Chapter Board for the IWRA. <clears throat> following the dissemination of this link that Scott mentioned to the LinkedIn um, website and, and YouTube. Um, we'll also be having a call for expressions of interest for people to join in um, uh, and be involved in, in this new chapter. And we're very much looking for representation on the board across um, all of Oceania, Micronesia, Polynesia, Melanesia, New Zealand and Australia. Um, looking at including uh, both the natural and social sciences and also being sure to have representation for gender equality, um, diversity um, and youth as well. <clears throat> if we get back to the topic of, of what we're talking about today and the water challenges, um, we decided to break this up into two key questions um, to try and um, contain it and constrain it in, in this webinar. Um, uh, and there's unique challenges in Oceania, um, both the, the um, geographic um, uh, challenges uh, and the distance and, and the island-based nations of, of a lot of this part of the world. Um, and these also present unique opportunities uh, for the sustainable use of water resources um, and meeting the 2030 agenda in this part of the world. So today we want to talk about what are the most urgent water challenges in Oceania today and also what are those on the horizon that need to be prepared for. <clears throat> there are many challenges um, in many parts of the hydrological cycle um, and one thing here at GWI speaking to that breadth of experience um, and expertise in um, water across UNSW, uh, we're trying to break that down into three main areas which is your surface water, your groundwater and your marine waters uh, and looking at how do we sustainably manage this resource uh, in an integrated manner. Um, so at GWI, this is something that we're trying to um, facilitate uh, and something that, that some parts of the university have been doing very well, looking at these different parts of the water cycle. Um, and if you want to manage one, then you also need to be aware of the um, impacts and implications that might be having um, on another part of the hydrological system. So if we keep that in mind, um, I've got two um, examples um, I'd like to uh, quickly, quickly run through. Uh, this one here is of the Water Research Laboratory uh, and the restoration of the Tamago wetland, which is a, a tidal wetland uh, sort of mid uh, coast of, of New South Wales. Uh, this was a very successful restoration um, of a very heavily um, debilitated uh, wetland environment um, using an approach with smart water um, meters uh, and technologies um, and also an environment based approach. Um, and this achieved um, environmental sustainability um, by looking at the existing knowledge and existing um, practice worldwide that was out there. And that's something that I think is key in this part of the world is making sure that we share um, the successes. And also I think as Paul is going to be speaking to, sharing um, the failures as well. Um, so we learn from that and, and we, we, we move forward together. Um, but engineering was a large part of this solution as well. Um, and that's something that the Oceania region um, is, is heavily reliant on is engineering based solutions um, as we'll come to um, shortly with the, the sea level rise and, and those issues there. Um, but also the community involvement um, and, and having people having buy into this process was a large part of its success. You'll see there with the third point down that the assigning of a ranger um, ensured the long term uh, monitoring and sustainability 
uh, on the site um, and, and having that um, uh, responsibility tied to a, um, a position of, of importance. The second uh, example I'd like to uh, briefly cover um, uh, is also comes from our water research laboratory, and this is based on um, a partnership in the Cook Islands. Um, and uh, one of our principal engineers, Matt Blacker, working up there on um, Miti Vai Kitavai, which means from water to walker, water to water, excuse me, in Cook Islands, Maori. And this is looking at uh, uh, water flow and eutrophication or nutrient um, overload um, in this uh, lagoon here. And there's been some work done um, with consultants and with the Cook Island government looking at the um, inflow of groundwater and the nutrients that are coming into to one end of the, of the lagoon and the impacts that is having on the, uh, the, the uh, water health um, and, and algal blooms in the lagoon itself. And this was one thing, if you're just trying to tackle the problems of algal growth within the, the lagoon and not looking at the input of nutrients from, from groundwater, then you wouldn't be able to effectively manage the solution. And so it was knowing where these nutrient inputs were going into the groundwater where they were coming into the lagoon to then effectively manage um, this, this prime tourist location. I'm just going to quickly look at what I thought at a very broad level, again, speaking from GWI and this breadth of experience across the university, trying to, to represent um, three points of what I thought were the most urgent water challenges in Oceania today. And I'd be very happy to hear um, from the audience on, on their thoughts of these and also from our, our other panelists. But one, of course, in this part of the world more than other is sea level rise. Um, it's not just a future problem. It's, it's uh, very apparent this is issues. Um, this issue um, is affecting communities in um, uh, island nations uh, already, um, as well as coastal regions of, of larger countries such as Australia too. And this also has an impact on groundwater resources. Many of the groundwater resources um, are not yet adequately defined or understood. And we're already having um, intrusion of, of saline water and seawater into these. And, and before we have a chance to um, constrain and use these resources, um, they're, they're already becoming um, contaminated by encroaching uh, seawater. And also, of course, there's the coastal vulnerabilities. Um, this includes the obvious um, physical vulnerability of shore-based communities um, and increasing sea level rise, also having increased um, storm surge levels during uh, major weather events. Um, and as well as the vulnerabilities to um, coastal industry as well. Um, people that are reliant on aquaculture, on um, fisheries, um, tourism, and, and other things like that in, in Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Island uh, countries in this part of the world. Um, the coast is, is where, we, where we all live pretty much. The second point is the increased frequency um, of high uh, intensity weather events. This impacts um, water and sanitation uh, and health infrastructure. Uh, if you have a large um, uh, cyclonic event that knocks out your water treatment systems, um, you can go from one day to the next um, with having no potable water, um, which then affects um, well-being and health, um, in some cases quite severely, um, in, in different parts of this region. Uh, and building a resilience to that is something that will come to on, on, on the next slide. And then, of course, and this speaks more to the Pacific Island nations, is that the transport infrastructure and the importance of ports um, and if we look at uh, the, um, some major weather events that take out port infrastructure, this can severely handicap um, the resilience or the bounce back after these events because air transport into some of these, these um, locations is just not possible or not um, uh, frequent enough. And the third point is looking at climate change and changes in rainfall patterns. In Australia at the moment, we are facing uh, drought um, and we have need to build in agricultural resilience to um, allow our farmers and our agricultural sector to uh, be able to ride out increasing um, uh, intensity in, in uh, high and low rainfall periods um, and, and how, how do we help, um, uh, help uh, with agricultural and technological solutions and embracing environmental water needs at the same time how do we bring that in for effective land management? And this also ties into the water infrastructure I mentioned before, um, allowing enough water for our urban centres as well. Then if we could consider the second uh, part of the question I wanted to pose, which is what are the water challenges on the horizon that we need to be prepared, prepared for? Um, the three here are the sustainable management of the water resources that is in sync um, with sustainable economic development. 
I think it's important that the water resources, um, we, we're um, aware the water resources play a crucial role um, in um, the well-being and um, economic benefits of, of societies in many, many different ways. Um, the second one is building the climate change adaptation capacity and breaking this down into three sub-components. One is the, the human side of things, empowered and resilient communities, um, industries and countries, both across Oceania and as a region as a whole. As I mentioned at the start of my um, presentation, um, the sharing of, of experiences and the sharing of knowledge um, is something that's going to be key to, to achieving this fast and if we try and all do it alone. And um, the second one was, one was infrastructure, um, which is also the long term um, resilience um, uh, of uh, washing infrastructure, transport and emergency response. Um, and lastly was the environment and the ecosystem services um, needed to safeguard against rainfall and hydrological variations. Lastly is the better understanding um, the response of groundwater resources to current and predicted future climate impacts. And this is, of course, looking at and including the understanding between groundwater, freshwater um, and marine waters. And it's this space that I'm very, very interested in as well is that the uh, reliance on the coastal zone and the interaction of these three water types um, is something we're going to have to get very good at quite quickly in this part of the world in order to uh, meet the um, Agenda 2030 and work towards sustainable use of um, our water resources. Uh, thank you very much. That's it from me. Well, thank you so much for that presentation and sort of opening up the conversation we're going to have today around the water management in the Oceania region. You know, one of the things I thought was really interesting, the way you sort of brought together questions around engineering and then sort of the social sciences community building, um, which are often kind of treated as two completely different areas. And there's not a lot of interdisciplinary work, particularly around those. Um, I think there's maybe more around uh, chemistry or biology side, but uh, bringing in that engineering perspective, which is a completely different, uh, is really important. And I think in your region particularly, uh, can play a particularly strong role because uh, of the unique challenges uh, lower, uh, like you said, bring in the different types of types of water, fresh water, ocean water, marine water, uh, and the unique challenges posed by climate change as well. So. That was really interesting. Thank you for, for that presentation. Um, our next presenter is going to be Dr. Amelia Tarucci. Um, so let me. Set that up. Okay. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay, is my screen okay? Yes. Looks right, great. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. all. I'm Dr. Amelia from the um, School of Public Health and Primary Care at the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences from the PG National University. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, WASH. Um, post-disaster risk, uh, wash risk amongst vulnerable population in Fiji. Why I picked this topic was uh, you would all know that Fiji actually was faced with a um, Cat 5 uh, uh, cyclone uh, two years ago and that actually challenged most of our services, particularly from the environmental health perspective. Uh, for those of you who are watching from uh, outside of the Pacific region, uh, Fiji is right here on the map. Um, and uh, consists of uh, two bigger islands, major islands. We have Piti Levu and Bonua Levu. And um, we are yet to reach the million count, population count. A very young population, though, with our median age between 27 point two eight years old for males and 27.8 for, uh, for females. Uh, we have about 330, uh, approximately 330 islands with only 110 that's inhabited uh, in Fiji. Um, going to the uh, theme of uh, the um, webinar that we have uh, regarding water resources, uh, Fiji is uh, 
I would say is lucky in the Pacific region in the sense that we don't, though uh, some of our islands uh, do suffer from a lack of water supply, but we are not uh, in short supply. We actually have uh, about 90% of the population that have access to water supply and about 70%, uh, almost 70% uh, have access to treated water supply and the rest are actually supplied by boreholes, um, trust, spring sources, uh, rainwater tanks uh, supply, um, but uh, overall uh, water supply in Fiji uh, seems to be okay. Uh, looking at, uh, this is actually uh, the recent uh, data collected from our 2017 um, census, and uh, so I could say that this is actually very recent, and uh, uh, despite the, uh, the the disaster that we faced in 2016, uh, can, uh, I'm kind of like uh, happy to say that our water supply uh, for most of the regions have been restored. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in terms of sanitation um, situation, whilst about only 21% have access to sewage uh, treatment, uh, sewage treatment uh, system, um, more than um, around 62% still have septic tank system, whereas the others would actually have water seal, uh, piglet drains and uh, others. Um, you'll notice that I've actually put there is a disaster uh, a risk Given that, uh, regardless, uh, given that we've, although we have uh, a lot of uh, our water supply is sufficient uh, for Fiji, the risks that we have should uh, we cat to uh, suffer another cat five uh, category, uh, the, we are not really connected uh, to the system, to the proper disposal system. Um, while 60% or 63% have direct water supply to dwelling houses, um, we are only 21% are connected to the proper sewerage treatment uh, system. And uh, the 62% is actually uh, distributed all over Fiji. Uh, the risks that they face is uh, should, particularly in lower lying areas, we are having uh, issues faced with climate change, with a high watermark, uh, places that normally do not experience um, flooding, any small rain that would actually happen uh, would cause flooding. And uh, the risk that we have most uh, with septic tank system, uh, risks of backflow uh, in the sewage system, that's actually very uh, high. Uh, we experience that lately uh, around April, um, March, April, where we had uh, the Western Division usually suffers from this. And most of these septic tank system are actually concentrated around the Western Division and um, off the main uh, Vitilevo Island. So the risk of backflow, which means that people, a majority of the population are going to be exposed to untreated sewer, uh, with unknown microbes and uh, which would actually cause other communicable infectious diseases and also risks of high risk of vector-borne diseases, uh, it's actually high. Um, and that's actually a concern uh, for, uh, for Fiji. Uh, during post-disaster uh, um, in, uh, in any country, Fiji or any country. Uh, the, ma the main services that are usually accessed are the emergency services in terms of medical uh, system and uh, medical supply, medical treatment and all that. From the EH perspective is uh, identifying the sites for uh, play, uh, positioning uh, those uh, services should the structures, the existing structures are actually damaged. Uh, shelter, okay, and that is a development control issue for the environmental health services. 
Uh, I'm switching to the environmental health services because the WASH component or WASH services in Fiji is mainly handled by the environmental health services. Water supply, uh, ensuring that they safe quality uh, drinking water supply that's actually provided to those affected in disasters, post disasters. That's actually uh, from the aside from the Water Authority of Fiji, the environmental health services and, and she needs to ensure that. Uh, food services, safe food handling, sanitary facilities, uh, ensuring that they have proper, safe sanitary facilities and uh, sufficient, adequate for the number of displaced uh, population. And um, I brought in the e hate services uh, into my discussion because currently in Fiji we are act actually at a crossroad uh, where our services has been uh, uh, decentralized. Uh, not only decentralized because previously we would have the local rural local authority services and the urban local authority services uh, recent changes uh, it's an opportunity where the uh, while the urban rural local authorities are serviced uh, fall under the ministry of local government the uh, the rural local authorities fall under the ministry of health the current challenge that they that we have is shifting of services, uh, expanding the boundary of the urban uh, local authorities of the council, which has now covered the rural local authorities. Um, there is uh, an opportunity, while it's challenging, it's an opportunity because shifting services would mean that they are able to be uh, in one um, ministry. Uh, what happens during disaster is the uh, environmental health services within the Ministry of Health are usually mobilized a lot in terms of servicing or uh, reaching out for post-disaster response uh, activity. Um, the current situation where we are in, it's currently challenging. While there's still so many questions, still so many things that are actually in limbo at the moment, uh, it's a new beginning for uh, the service and still challenging, it's mostly working in the chartered waters. Why it's at a risk at the moment? We are coming towards uh, the um, coming towards our cyclone period. We're getting closer to that, and we are still in that. It's uh, in that uh, area of uh, well, I wouldn't say um, we are in limbo, but it's challenging, and um, hopefully uh, we will be able to be settled before. Uh, God forbid, another disaster strike in, in the coming months. Um, wash services, water and sanitation, particularly water supply. Um, shifting of boundaries, uh, the, these offices in the urban local authorities going into areas where they don't know uh, and uh, demarcating of uh, activities. Uh, we are hoping that uh, things would actually normalize. Uh, the main concern in wash uh, services, water supply, while that's been handled by another authority, the Water Authority of Fiji, the environmental health services are required by law to actually test the quality of water supply. And given the situation that we are in, it's current, uh, currently very challenging. Similarly with sanitary facilities, while it's actually the responsibility, uh, of uh, the environmental health service to ensure that everyone is actually uh, accessible to proper sanitation uh, services. The current situation where we are in is also challenging, uh, particularly when one of the challenges that one of the activity main uh, key result area, key activity of environmental health services in terms of development control covers mostly the sanitary facilities. And that's also another question, uh, one of the issues that's currently challenging in PG. So that's an area where um, it's currently uh, challenging, currently something that uh, uh, we are currently faced with in Fiji. But at the same time, it's an opportunity given that there is, uh, although we're working into uncharted waters, there's an opportunity to, commit, to work with other uh, other ministries, other departments. Uh, the opportunity that we see from the academic side, moving into a new um, ministry, 
we have our stakeholders, key stakeholders that normally assist us uh, in terms of planning, uh, water supply, housing, and all, um, and uh, rural uh, services. Uh, again, it's uncharted waters for, uh, for Fiji. And uh, that's uh, briefly the situation in Fiji. And uh, hopefully would actually um, in the future would be solved uh, so that we can actually continue to provide the uh, wash, proper wash services in Fiji. Thank you from Fiji. Well, I thought that was a really great presentation and, you know, you, you rooted it really in the Fiji perspective, but I think it has a lot of applicability to countries throughout the Oceania region, but around the world because the way that climate change is changing the nature, the intensity, the duration, the impact of natural disasters, and that itself is causing us to need to re conceptualize how our institutions and actors respond to these problems, particularly in the wash sector, as you highlight. Um, and it's, it's impacting new geographies, areas that weren't previously perhaps at risk. Um, and we have to step up our game, I think, but recognize that it's happening in a changing um, perspective, a changing climate, so that we're kind of in a constant need to reevaluate and uh, alter our, our response patterns. Um, I thought that was really good. Um, Really insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next presenter is Professor Paul Jengles. Uh, Paul, it's all yours. Are we here? Just give me a moment. I want to get this uh, started, as we all have to do from time to time. Now let's get up there. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you can you see the screen? Yes, we can. All right. Um, yeah, Amelia, thanks for that. I think that gives us a wonderful insight into kind of how the system works and probably what you said and what Scott has also said, it works this, not the same, but the elements of that right across the Pacific. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today on just a few examples uh, on the, what I would call the small community water supply interventions I would focus on a few South Pacific island countries, and I'm just going to emphasize that in, in our efforts to do things right to support communities, we often get it wrong a bit. And I think there's a lesson to be learned in this for all of us. And I'm going to show you something that's probably happening in the areas along these other countries. I'm not going to be specific about where or too specific, is uh, that little slither that you saw on Amelia's slide around the ones that do not have access directly to a larger system. So a real small community water supply situation. But I think before we continue, let's just have a good look at this uh, this little name of Oceania. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the definition of that lately, but it's anywhere from about here on East Timor right through to South America, this whole area here. Otherwise, people also refer to it, I think, uh, Dave, as the Blue Continent. I think SPC has a a kind of a fond name for that, but it looks a bit like this. It is a vast area. So it, uh, okay. Paul, I, we're not seeing your, uh, PowerPoint. If you could just bring the PowerPoint up to full screen. We're seeing a nice background of that mountain, though. That's a nice mountain. Is it up? Nope. Yeah. Nope. Now it's that. It just it does take a second. There's kind of a, a little lag sometimes. Didn't mean to cut you off there, but it looked like you were getting going on a, on a good run, so I didn't want to. So where, where where did you lose me, by the way? We don't so have you your... the PowerPoint? No uh, PowerPoint. The... Yeah, uh, didn't really ever get you. So I'm sorry about this, but let's just, just... Um, I think you had mentioned you were switching your monitors perhaps a little bit. Um, so if you could just... There we go. I'm seeing something now. Just make that full screen. All right. Shall we go back to the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we and, go. Uh, get that in presenter mode there. And can you see the can you see the monitor now? The the present presentation actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. We can see the presentation. Just uh, make it uh, uh, 
fill the whole screen, the presentation part, not so that we don't see all the boxes and everything. Well, that's what was supposed to happen because that's where we were at, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that's now something, something seems to have gone wrong. Just give us a moment, people. Um, just uh, put it there, there in the presenter mode. Nope, I lost you. Go back. Just give me a moment. Yes, I'm Good. doing that on purpose. Ah. Out again. I'm sorry, some, something has gone know. wrong here. Just hang on, uh, just for a moment. What can you see at the moment? Do you just see nothing? Uh, the, mountain. the mountain. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think, Paul, your full screen is probably going to another monitor. Yeah, we had that tested in a moment. Let me just restart the program for a moment here. It was working a while ago. <coughs> and now it doesn't. So call me Murphy if you wish. But um, at least your desktop is much cleaner than mine is, Paul. Yeah, yeah, you're extremely organized. Scott, I wonder if uh, if it's possible that you can continue with somebody else. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Let's um. Do that. Let me second just there. That something's gone wrong here. It was all set up, but not now. Dave, are you are you uh, ready to uh, jump on? Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna send it to you, and and Paul I'll give you a second to get things sorted there. There you go, Dave. And. Uh, Oh. oh, I'm having it show my screen. Okay, how are we? We're are you great. seeing that? Yeah, we are. That looks yeah. good. Dave, you with us? Well, this is no good. <laughs> okay, um, Dave? He seems to be frozen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Okay, uh, Lucy, how do you feel about jumping sure. up and then we'll just sort of circle back around? No big deal. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, go with you and there we go. Looks beautiful. All good, and you can hear me. I can. I can hear you. <laughs> Excellent. So you and SW is on top of things. <laughs> good. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I'm uh, located at the uh, University of New South Wales, the same as Dancy, uh, but located in the Water Research Centre, which falls under the umbrella of GWI or the Global Water Institute. Uh, so what I thought I'd do today is, is give you a bit of a, a flavour of some of the research that um, our group has been working on. Uh, I think as Dancy mentioned, we have a lot of um, breadth and depth at UNSW in our water research and, and the particular group that I'm working with is on the hydroclimatology side uh, and so we are very interested in what happens to water resources at the catchment scale and then looking potentially a little bit bigger looking at sort of the regional scale and um, thinking about what some of the challenges might be for our region but also um, globally um, what some of the, the challenges are and then also looking at how we can take the research that we do and then put it into practice. And so thinking about how we can translate some of the computational methods that we use or the, the technologies that we use and think about how they can um, actually apply when we start looking at trying to manage our water resources um, or deal with them as they might change uh, in the future. So we were talking before about um, taking a bit of an engineering perspective of things, and that's certainly my perspective. Um, so I, I'm part of the Faculty of Engineering at UNSW, which is the largest faculty um, of engineering in Australia. And, and so we do have um, a real 
uh, depth of research and, and we work across a number of different sectors outside of water as well. But one of the, the strongest foci within the faculty is water. Um, and so we have a number of researchers who, walk, who work across the whole spectrum of um, water related problems. And as engineers, we are interested in problem solving and interested in identifying the, the problems that um, may be most relevant for our region um, and how we can use our engineering know-how then to um, find solutions to those problems. So as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm located at the Water Research Centre, uh, but then also um, specifically located in the hydrology group in the Water Research Centre. So myself, Ashish Sharma and Fiona Johnson are the main um, researchers or the, the primary researchers within that research, research centre, but then we also have about about 30 PhD students, a number of research associates who um, also work with us. And so a lot of the, the research that I'll present to you today it comes out of um, myself and Fiona and Ashish, our research papers, and then also the students who are driving a lot of that uh, research. So our strengths, like I mentioned, are at the catchment scale. We also look at how we can translate the um, methods that we apply at one catchment to other catchments and so look at um, casting across different stream networks or regionalizing up to you know, a larger scale as well. And then our disciplinary expertise is really in mathematical modeling, it's in hydroclimatology, in humanitarian engineering, and then also in forecasting and design. And so focusing a, a little bit more on the practical engineering side and, and thinking about how the availability of water resources um, could affect our design approaches. Um, and just to, to give a, a good plug for, um, for the Water Research Centre, we are a really um, highly ranked uh, research group. So we're ranked fifth within the world, which we are very proud of, and ranked first within Australia. And so there, there is a, a, a lot of researchers who are performing at a very high level um, and who are doing um, interesting work a lot across a whole bunch of different water-related uh, problems. So if we think specifically about the, the work that we do and the sorts of problems that we are interested, two very strong themes come out um, of our work, and that is research related to flooding and research related to droughts. Um, as Dancy mentioned, we are in the midst of a very strong drought in Australia, but um, if you'd spoken to us a couple of years previously, we would be focusing a lot more on, on flooding and what some of the impacts of that are in Australia. So it's well recognised that these are incredibly important hazards. They have significant impacts on our infrastructure, on our communities, and we do face them year after year. And then also we have um, uh, fairly significant changes that we can observe in their severity and in the frequency with which floods and, and droughts come back. So a lot of what we are interested in is how we can actually reduce the potential impact um, of flooding or droughts given 21st century problems associated with increasing urbanization, changing land use, um, changing climate patterns, but then also how can we address these given changes in technology and given changes in our, in our knowledge um, of the mechanisms behind floods and droughts. Um, and so I thought I'd give you a bit of a, a taste of the sort of full scale of um, methods that we're using to deal with, with some of these um, emerging problems and um, their emerging impacts. So the University of New South Wales has a really long history of um, developing best practice to deal with flooding in particular. The, the standard um, in uh, Australia for engineering design for developing um, methods related to flooding is referred to as uh, Australian Rainfall and Runoff. It's a, a guideline that was first developed in 1958 and in every um, iteration of this um, design manual that has been developed since then, Australian researchers and, and UNSW researchers really have been at the forefront of uh, developing some of these um, methods to try to deal with um, floods and, and how we actually can design for them. So there was a, a very recent iteration of Australian rainfall and runoff a couple of years ago that has come out and is now being put into practice um, with uh, engineers all throughout Australia. And we've developed a number of methods that have been put in place in, in Australian rainfall and runoff um, uh, that uh, so that are form, informing the practice but really have been developed out of a, a lot of the the research approaches and um, some of the research studies that we've done 
So if we think in, in light of um, UNSW's uh, long history um, with flooding and then with also of looking at droughts, I wanted to give a really brief summary of what we see as some of the key challenges and, and opportunities that we're tackling. And if we look at, and firstly, in terms of the challenges, like I mentioned, the, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that we see, um, particularly in water resources design and in taking an engineering approach, are issues related to non-stationarity. So a lot of the methods that we use are predicated on this assumption that the climate system is not changing, that the catchments we are managing are not changing, and it is becoming more and more um, evident that that's not true, that we see significant non-stationarity in um, climate drivers, uh, in our hydroclimatology. We see significant non-stationarity in the um, catchments that we're investigating that might be sources of um, our water resources. So uh, that, that can be due to um, land cover change or land use change. Um, and we also see non-stationarity in what the dominant hydrologic processes are in any catchment and that's you know even if the catchment isn't undergoing any change and so dealing with that is an issue and then related to that um, a lot of my research then is also involved in um, dealing with uncertainty and so being actually able to recognize that um, the observations that we take of our hydrologic systems and our water resources have uncertainty associated with them. And the technical methods, the uh, models that we use, the analysis that we use, they have uncertainties associated with them as well. And being able to try to constrain those uncertainties and quantify them in some way. But alongside with those challenges, we also have significant opportunities. So we have new mathematical models and new understanding of um, flow processes and of what is driving floods and droughts at the same time. We have new data and observing technologies. And so um, what I'll present just briefly is a, a summary of some of um, the remote sensing technologies that we use and that can really inform our best practice when it comes to water resources um, analysis and management. And then in particular, we have improved computing power and, and improved computational techniques. And there's been a lot of research that we've done around different computational methods for dealing with non-stationarity in catchments or in um, climate. And so being able to take those computational techniques and put them in practice is what I think is the next challenge for us. Um, so I want, I'm very conscious of time and I just want to give you a, a flavour for some of the research projects that um, we've been working on and um, I'll, I'll show here a number of different research publications that we have coming out of some of these different research projects and I, I know that you're going to make these slides available later so I encourage people to, to come back and access them or contact me if they're interested in any of these um, research publications. One of the things that we are um, particularly interested in is looking at what is driving floods and what the, the state of the science is um, in, in terms of uh, investigating what the, the main drivers of floods are and, and how they might be changing in the future or what some of the, the gaps are in actually um, dealing with flood drivers. And so one of my um, colleagues, Fiona Johnson, recently authored this publication that looked specifically at um, flooding uh, drivers uh, across Australia and identified this need for us to develop um, new models that can deal with flooding and the interaction between um, climatic drivers and hydrologic processes across a number of different spatiotemporal scales. You know, the fact that we are interested in flooding on potentially an annual scale or looking at the immediate impacts as soon as a flood has occurred and that we do need different models to deal with that. So alongside with that, a lot of my research then has been about developing new mathematical models that can take the complexity that we know exists within our natural catchments and within our urban catchments and translate that into tractable modeling frameworks. And, and so um, mathematical representations of what the catchment processes are. So we have um, different uh, papers that um, are aimed at incorporating vegetation processes into our um, hydrologic models and then evaluating how um, important that might be for being able to appropriately forecast when a low flow period or a drought is likely to occur versus a flood. Um, we have publications that look at automated model building, so ways of um, having multiple models that can be generated automatically, which reduces the burden on a hydrologist to develop their own model. Um, and we also have papers that are aimed at looking at transferring models between catchments. And so if we have a lot of information for one catchment, how we might apply it um, elsewhere. 
But then alongside with that, we are increasingly recognising that these sorts of models don't do very well or don't deal very well with non-stationarity in the hydrologic processes or with a catchment that's changing. Um, and so this is a, a bit of a snapshot of uh, a model that we were developing for a catchment um, where the catchment had undergone significant urbanisation. So you, you can see the two photographs that are, the, that are at the top there um, that we had uh, in 2008 for this catchment. It was, there wasn't a significant degree of urbanisation. You might develop a model um, under these stationary conditions, but then if you look several years from there, if you were interested in forecasting what the water resource availability might be um, in the future, the model that we had developed for these previous conditions is no longer going to be representative of what the future conditions is. And so even though we can develop these cool modelling frameworks and, and new models that represent hydrologic processes very well, that they may not be robust when it comes to um, future conditions within a catchment. And so one of the things that we've become increasingly interested in is um, ways in which we can merge real-time observations with our modelling framework so that we can um, improve the way in which our models adapt to change. And so in this case, I, I pulled this from an earlier figure. It's a, it's a little bit an earlier presentation, it's a little bit mathematical. Um, but in this case, we're looking at, say we have a, a forecast, and in this case, we might be looking at forecasting, say stream flow, that's what the state refers to um, on the axis there. And we have a model that represents that forecast, but we have um, observation after a, a certain amount of time that shows that the model was incorrect um, and that there was a bias in the model prediction. And so the whole aim behind data assimilation or the techniques that we use is to try to merge those two pieces of information. So take into account what the model is telling us about the state um, of a catchment as well as what the observation is telling us about the state of a catchment so that we end up with an improved forecast um, in a region. And this is one way of dealing with situations where there is particular bias in our model because we have a catchment that's undergone um, significant change. And so the question that comes out of this then might be, well, how do we get these observations? You know, what sort of real-time data do we need um, to be able to improve our models in this way? Um, because surely this only applies in catchments where you have on the ground gauges, which is very rare and particularly around Oceania, there are very few catchments that are gauged in this way. Just briefly, we have a, a bunch of papers that are out about um, these different computational techniques for um, dealing with catchments that are undergoing this sort of change and um, being able to uh, adapt our models so that they can um, represent the current conditions within a catchment rather than um, the conditions that have been in the past, you know, before there was significant urbanisation or some sort of land use change. Uh, anyway, but how, how do we get these sorts of observations? And so a, a lot of what we've been interested in then is actually taking advantage of remote sensing technologies because these are globally available. They don't um, have to be, they're not located on the ground. They um, are available in areas that might have previously been thought of as being poorly gauged or poorly observed. Um, but they are at much larger scales than um, potentially are useful for the sort of catchment scale analysis that we do. And so we have a number of students who are working on the use of remotely sensed data for water resource applications. So, so in this case, we're looking actually in elsewhere, we're looking in Vietnam, um, but using um, uh, observations of uh, river heights, um, or trying to predict, sorry, we're trying to predict um, uh, river heights based on temperature uh, estimation, because we have previous work that has identified that we can use um, real-time differences in daytime and nighttime temperatures as an indicator of the extent of a flood, uh, because if you have much higher water levels, so if you if you are in, in a particularly wet period where you have a very um, large uh, flood extent then you are likely to have um, some buffering in your temperature variables. And so you have a smaller difference between daytime and nighttime temperatures, um, which can be remotely observed. So we can observe 
surrogate variables that might allow us to indicate where floods occur in regions where we don't have a lot of data. And so we have some, some students who um, are working specifically in this area and have some research that has come out of this. And then finally, what we're also interested in is, okay, so we have a bunch of research that is related to new models, new computational techniques, dealing with catchments that are undergoing change. And we also have um, Fiona and Ashish in particular are very interested in how we deal with climatic change and, and being able to evaluate um, what sort of uh, changes do we see in um, our catchments at the moment that could be attributed to warming temperatures. Um, and what's likely to happen in the future. So um, can we develop methods that will allow us to look for when our water resources cross um, certain thresholds so that we see behaviour that potentially we haven't seen before or that could be an indicator of increased floods or droughts. And so one of the papers that um, my colleagues were associated with is, is this one here that looked uh, globally at a, a whole bunch of um, data related to flooding and temperatures and um, evaluated that even though, uh, indicated that even though we are likely to see, it's fairly well um, recognised that we're likely to see more intense rainfall in regions, that this doesn't always necessarily um, translate into more intense flooding and that we're likely to see disproportional impacts depending on whether you're in urban areas or if you're in regional areas. Um, or agricultural areas and that it's really related to um, antecedent moisture conditions and, and whether if you are in a region that um, has undergone significant drying, um, if the um, importance of those antecedent conditions or the, the prevalence of those um, antecedent conditions is going to affect what the, the rate of the flooded attenuation is. Um, and so we have some high profile papers that have been developed on this. And then we have um, some other work that our students are working on that um, is actually looking at um, how we think our um, rainfall or precipitation patterns are, are likely to change in the future by using weather generators. Um, and so trying to determine what happens for um, uh, particular catchments if we do see these increases in intensity of rainfall events or if we see um, increases say in our um, wet day persistence or our dry day persistence and, and how the changes in those um, climatological variables are actually going to impact the methods that we might use um, in uh, a flood design manual like Australian rainfall and runoff. So um, if these changes in hydroclimatological variables are going to have an impact on the actual Actual design methods that we use when we put this um, all in practice. Um, I, I think the biggest take-home message from all of this though is that what we've found really as the key to success for a lot of our research and for the, the more broad spread, broad spread uh, impact of our research is really strategic collaborations between um, universities and industries or community groups um, or governmental groups so that a lot of this research can be put in practice. And we have um, a number of uh, different uh, partnerships between research groups and between governmental organisations or non-governmental organisations um, as a way of um, evaluating how effective some of the methods are that, that we've been using in practice. So this example of one that um, is in partnership with Melbourne Water that's looking at um, how climate change might be affecting water quality variables. And we have um, uh, an, another one that is looking at potable water treatment um, and looking at catchment monitoring and um, how we can um, use catchment monitoring as a way of evaluating how catchments are going to um, respond to climate change. Um, and I, I do think that one of the, the benefits to a lot of the work that we are doing is that we have breadth of experience, expertise, as Dancy was saying earlier, um, across the whole range of different water disciplines and then outside of water um, as well, um, that are really allows us to tackle some of these complex multidisciplinary problems. Um, and then, then so the challenge remains to us to how we actually put this in practice.
So the take home message um, that I think that there, we have significant ongoing um, uncertainty and non-stationarity in our water resources systems and in how we observe them, but that there are lots of new opportunities really in um, remotely sensed technologies with new computational techniques um, and that by taking advantage of some of these new opportunities, we can deal with some of this non-stationarity and change. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really great. And I think really covered a lot of the work that you're doing down there and, and the importance also of bringing in uh, new technologies, new data to feed our models and to really get us the, the, the best uh, way to predict the future changes and impacts of climate change on our water resources. Um, we are moving just a little bit short on time, even though we have lost Dave. Um, so we're gonna go directly now to Paul. And if anyone has questions, just a quick reminder with the time that we have left before um, we've gone past uh, 90 minutes. We're going to have questions, and so you can go ahead and type those in right now on your GoToWebinar control panel. It's about halfway down. There's a box that says questions. Go ahead and type it in. I'll see the question. I know a couple of you already sent yours in, so we'll go to those right after. Um, if we get Dave back, we'll listen to him, and if we don't, well, that's more time for questions. Dave, I'm you're back. back. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I, speaking of the devil. Um, okay, well, we are going to go to Paul, and then we're going to go to Dave. Uh, I'd like to ask you both to keep your presentations to 10 minutes, as close as possible. Thank you. Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, Paul, you might want to take yourself off uh, mute there, if you were. Can you see the screen? I can see the screen. I can hear you fine. That's beautiful. So that means we are a go. Can you? Um... OK, so I've got all kinds of other things on my screen here as well, but I hope I can see what I need to talk about. Colleagues, The uh, uh, thank you. I think the coming back to where we originally were, let's start off again by talking about small community water supplies in South Pacific island countries. Um, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, I'm also affiliated with the Fiji National University. I also work from time to time where Amelia works, and I've got some other affiliations as well, with uh, rather long stretching back into the past involvement in small community water supply. And it was also quite fascinating when I started working in the, in the Pacific, what we found there. And I'm going to show you a very short snapshot of some of the things we had found in terms of trying to what I call getting it wrong when we're trying to do it right. So just before we getting and go any further into uh, into the detail, you, do you, we all know where Oceania is. It's um, just, I think, a rather almost colloquial term for this area here, which, uh, which also is called sometimes the Blue Continent. It's huge, and all of these island groups out here. Fiji is over there, as Amelia has shown earlier, and then the work I'm going to show you today is just in the small parts of these islands out there. Very, very remote. Uh, you cannot get there by road. You can almost not get there by air. Sometimes you have to use the waterways. Honestly, what we have found out there is there's a lot of aid work going on. Aid organizations are doing tremendous work in uh, rolling out small community water supplies to areas which is not reachable by, for instance, the service as we saw a bit earlier that Amelia showed us about. Um, they're really remote, but they all have the same needs, of course, and that is a question of water. And we need to improve those water sources. That's usually the main mantra of uh, the aid that is be being offered in the area. What is generally trying to be achieved is to try and avoid untreated surface water. So if you are fortunate, you can be in an area where you could perhaps as some form of treatment of your surface water. In some areas, it does rain a lot, but in other areas, it don't. And we will wait and have to see what will happen with climate change over time, whether that will continue. Because there's another source that's quite valuable out, out on the smaller and remote parts of uh, Oceania, and that is harvesting the rain. I think here in Australia, that's already happening to a large extent in some areas. But out there, it becomes quite critical that this resource is also recognized. I'm going to focus a little bit on this resource because that becomes kind of the central theme of how I thought 
and what we've seen out there how people have got things wrong of course if you uh, don't have access to your surface water or if people instinctively understand that this water is not too clean to drink they will try and access groundwater which is often not aesthetically more pleasing and also taste and people would have an instinct that this water is better to use for instance for drinking but again being on a small patch of land that sits in the vast salty ocean this groundwater um, resources are also quite often under pressure they have very different characteristics in some parts they move much quicker from underfoot as the lens pushes back inland when the tides rise and uh, at some point later on in the day the fresh water is again available underfoot and i'll come back to the significance of that in a moment but then of course as these programs go we often try to improve the sanitation for various reasons uh, no more open defecation the ocean defecation might be a, a good reason to do that but uh, every once so often it's also a case of uh, making it safe for people or and so forth so one of the basic models that you would find out there is the sunken latrine or the pit latrine as we would call them but often as i will show a bit later on this tends out to happen rather weirdly that we often end up digging into our shallow groundwater lenses in order to provide people access to groundwater so how does this come into play and that's the central message this afternoon be very careful when we plan these things because often it seems quite a bit disconnected great effort and cost people uh, take those water tanks where we would want to store drinking water in over great distances this is delivered i cannot show too many pictures we have a slight time constraint on the process but they deliver these at the ocean and these are carried inside you can see what these are empty uh, water tanks to, to store water and they would put one or two on this kind of uh, carry uh, um, float and they would carry it up the streams because that's the open pathways they don't have to force too much space into the bush and otherwise so the drinking water would often be these waters these very waters that people would walk in but they if given a choice would prefer to use groundwater okay but then the the, the, the system goes a bit further the system, the water tank is erected and then a rainwater harvesting scheme of some kind is is is, is formulated so for instance in this case they would put a small uh, rainwater catchment roof over the over the uh, tank and with the uh, gutter at the back and a downpipe that goes into the tank people are immensely proud of these structures often because they are erected at some cost there are various models that you will find out there where people uh, are paying some parts of it some part is totally donated by the aid organization and so forth sometimes one wonders and that uh, that's the third area of my of my uh, kind of point i want to make we heard earlier today scott i think you said about rainwater i'm not sorry rainwater people's skill around building their resilience okay so if they understand that rainwater is going to be fresh and clean we can harvest it um the issue is how do i now make this optimum um just for a question can you all see uh, the whole picture over here you're not seeing my little uh, my little my little um Thing. So what you would see over here is the tank, pretty much the same setup, but you can also see the roof in the background. Um, that roof in the background is not gutted and it's not linked to anything. People got the same message as these, that this little tank will prove, this little roof will provide enough water to fill the tank. At really high, high rain season, very easily fill. Dry season, no. Other areas people do not have uh, corrugated or, or, you know, plates on the on the roof that water can run off from so what do you do now they get to put in a larger catchment for this tank some problems with that for instance the tank is very low you can see the spigot over there they can't get the container underneath so there's some other little areas around the design of the system which people don't always get right some people do get it right in some of the villages where you can see there are rather strong roofs over there they've got their down pipes and it all runs into this tank but it still remains a 5000 liter tank for instance uh, the water in a dry season does not go far so why are we saying all of this colleagues is that during dry season people resort back to a, a resource like this coming back with lucia had said it would be very interesting lucia on all that modeling scenarios as to looking at these really small patches of land that has a small lens of of fresh water sitting under there because that's really what happens for two, three months in a year, that in many, many areas, that's the only resource. 
sometimes even those streams dry up to, to, uh, to a trickle where people really would feel uncomfortable to drink from those. They will use it for other purposes, sure, and to bathe, perhaps wash clothes, but not for drinking. You can see the water down there, not too far underfoot, two, three meters max. They can reach it with a bamboo pole and a small container or vessel that they can extract water. So what we do now is that in order for us to get the sanitation right, you have found that literally thousands of these pit latrines have gone up, and we've seen these in appraisal of many of these systems, different shapes and sizes they go in, but they are dug right in a particular area where the water sits just down there, a meter, two meters, sometimes three meters down. Often when you're close to the coast, this water will be reasonably saline for parts of the day, but they know by the time that the tide retracts that the fresh water comes back underneath and they can then harvest it from there. And now we have pit latrines that are very, very close to our groundwater resources. And as we go on into the years of climate change, we have to really rethink every drop that we are going to use. How are we going to make sure that this problem doesn't keep on recurring? Because it does still to this very day. So some of the takeaway messages from this is it, suitable water sources will be increasingly under pressure as that's no, that is no uh, a big reasoning in there. Climate change will be the most important stressor of all of this. So we do not know when the rain will fall. Perhaps the rain, the dry and the wet seasons will move some areas. Perhaps the wet season will continue for a longer time. Uh, I think the predictions at the moment seem to be that wet seasons might even be shorter in the future. So more reason to harvest water sensibly. So we have to protect these um, good technological solutions. Even if you use surface water, which will still be probably the most abundant source, we need to see more treatment technologies out there that are driven by things like solar, for instance, that people are not uh, so vulnerable in terms of the groundwater resource or the bit of rainwater. Just coming back to that, uh, that story of the little catchment roofs, it does not take us long to understand that you will not have a sustainable water supply with those. Uh, but I could not find in any of the appraisals that we've done of these projects where the communities have been probably upskilled as to optimize the bit of water that they do get when there's a bit of rainwater to be harvested. So the other point then is people need to understand and train more and more. It needs to be embedded in the societal system how to optimize the water that they have. And then adequate sanitation is always important, but just take care of how it's implemented because it cannot come at the cost of water supply. We do need to look at alternative solutions there. Colleagues, that is my take home messages for the day. And that is it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, thank you for that presentation. That was really helpful. And I really liked that you were able to go in and highlight some of the work that's being done in these communities. Um, it's, it's a good perspective that I think we need to keep in mind and sort of foreground in a lot of the research and work that we're doing, the advocacy. Um, so thank you for that. That was really great. Um, we are going to go right now to Dave um, as we are running just a little short on time, but that's good. Uh, can I just check with you um, how much of my marvellous presentation you actually heard? I think I gave a terrific presentation a little while ago with a grand audience of zero. Uh -huh, yeah, uh, you did. Yeah, we didn't hear any of that. No, not at all. So I, I roll from the beginning. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. But it's good practice. Good practice, it's true. Yeah. You've got it down, so just uh, build from there. Okay, how are we? We're live? How's that? You're seeing my, you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Okay, yeah, greetings from the Pacific community, um, from Suva, um, and, um, and Bula, Dr. Taranga Mbethi from um, just up the road, I think. Uh, I'm in Tamavua looking at the sunset at the moment. So I'm uh, from the Pacific community, which is a regional organisation in the Pacific. We're 71 years old and we have 23 member uh, countries and territories which we work with, um, providing a range of technical services and technical backstopping, very often linking the capacity that exists in one country to, to help meet the needs that exist in another. I'm from the Disaster and Community Resilience Program and at SPC we're actually channeling most of our water resources, our water and sanitation work through that lens of disaster and community resilience. The sort of work we do at technical agency, we're working on the ground. Some of the issues that, uh, that you've raised so far, we're working on with our members, things like groundwater exploration, 
um, drought management, um, uh, wash and water quality. Uh, I, I, if to have time, I'd love to share some examples of the great work that Pacific Island uh, countries and communities are doing. But uh, I was going to focus rather on the region as a whole and how it's actually doing in terms of access to safe water and sanitation. And this is one of the challenges that we have in talking with partners at the international level to try and convey what the challenges are in this part of the world, um, particularly to a world that's so used to dealing with transboundary uh, issues and flooding and uh, large irrigation issues. One area that the Pacific is really um, uh, increasingly known for is natural disasters. And these photos are just examples from the last uh, uh, two to three years, estimated at a total cost of about 1.9 billion US dollars. And as we know, uh, disasters, uh, natural hazards, can be hydrological, they can be the result of the extremes of flooding and of drought. And uh, we know that uh, in the Pacific, there are six, uh, sorry, five Pacific Island countries that are in the top 15 uh, most vulnerable countries in the world, as estimated by the 2017 World Risk Index. And the two top countries in the world for vulnerability actually come from the Pacific. We know that there's six Pacific Island countries with no surface water resources and a further two with, with minimal, these are the, the low-lying uh, atoll countries. And we know that just in the last two years, there's been another six countries that have been subject to severe flooding events. And uh, Dr. Tarangabethi pointed out the, the, the wash-related uh, aspects of the dis of uh, post-disaster um, impacts that can just, just keep going on after a dis long after a disaster has struck. And in the Pacific, often we look at climate change and it's certainly, you know, as, as being the key issue, rising sea level uh, and, uh, and, and increasing extremes as being an issue. But we know that there's a base challenge already, the daily challenges faced by Pacific Island countries. And this is a way that we try to illustrate it sometimes to show that on top of these daily challenges, we have the mounting pressures of climate variability the floods, the drought, the ENSO swings in climate that we have in the Pacific. And on top of that is the impact, the, the mounting pressure of climate change, the changes in frequency, intensity and degradation of resources. These impacts move down. It makes it harder to actually get some of these base challenges met. And of course, one of the ways that we define our base challenges is through the SDGs and SDG 6. And as we know, it's the most important SDG. And of course, it's uh, central to all of the other, uh, so many other SDGs, particularly in the Pacific. So where are we now um, in relation to that, um, in relation to SDG 6? What we do know from uh, country reporting through the JMP is that only just over half of Pacific Islanders currently have access to an improved drinking water source. That number is worse for sanitation. Only around 31% of Pacific Islanders have access to improved sanitation facilities. And we know that 1.3 million Pacific Islanders continue to rely on the bush or the beach as their toilet because there's no other facilities. So compared to the rest of the world, we know the rest of the world's been doing pretty well in this regard. If we look at the y-axis being uh, access to at least basic water, zero to 100%, and the x-axis is sanitation. So we see that as you start getting towards Africa, it starts to get not so good, particularly in regard to sanitation. And whereas the Pacific sitting amongst all these regions, as a whole, the Pacific is sitting here. It's actually the worst performing region in the world in terms of access to safe water and sanitation. Now that's a big figure for the region. It's of course, it's, it's an average figure. There's huge variability, variation in this. And we know that if we remove the rural populations of Melanesia, which are significant in the Pacific, the figures look a little better. So it shows that there are pockets of vulnerability. The Pacific is not just one uniform um, population. And we know over the years, um, there's been tremendous progress in water and sanitation at the, at the global level. This is progress between 2000 and 2015. By comparison, the Pacific has been flatlining in sanitation and actually dropping a little with water as for the last reporting. 
This varies, as we said, widely across the region, varies from country to country. This is sanitation. This is access to safe water, varying again across countries and also within countries as well. These are provinces of the Solomon Islands showing there's a huge difference between provinces and their access to safe water supplies. And we know across uh, different socioeconomic groups, there's huge disparities. This is the, the comparison of access on the, the poorest 20% and the richest 20% in the Pacific and, and those in between. Perhaps the biggest, most pronounced disparities in the Pacific exist between urban and rural communities. Um, we know that uh, many uh, rural communities, uh, they're managing water in difficult circumstances. They're, they're not reached by utilities. Utilities uh, reach less than a quarter of all Pacific Islanders. So most water and sanitation is managed at the home or at the village level, or at the most maybe at the island council level. and uh, that's where the challenges are the greatest in the region. But this is an interesting chart that shows where some of the, um, the issues are. We, we know that our members, when they see these figures, they could be despairing because they're all making great progress in water and sanitation, improving capacity, improving connections. So why are these figures so bad and why are they going backwards? So this is from the Pacific Water and Wastewater Association benchmarking report that just came out for the 2017 year. And it shows for utilities, so this is the, those utilities covering around a quarter of Pacific Islanders, this is the coverage of their catchment um, customers of water services. And it shows that it's actually dropping in terms of percentages over the years, picking up a little bit in the last reported period. And even though all the utilities are increasing their coverage, improving their services, there are more people moving into their area that are not being covered. So this really captures the issue that while everybody is making progress, it's not keeping up with population growth, urbanisation, and also the impacts of climate change. And this shows just how challenging the task is ahead to actually meet the SDG goal of uh, universal access by 2030. A whole new trajectory is required in order to actually meet the projected uh, increased population of the Pacific. And that translates just for connection to water supply alone to uh, some 7.6 million people re would require new facilities to meet that target. So uh, these data um, are collected by our member countries um, as part of their, their um, census reporting and as part of their JMP reporting. Um, we work together with uh, UNICEF and WHO to put out every few years uh, synthesis reports, uh, annual snapshots, and also watch this space, I think, in the next uh, couple of months, hopefully by a forum leaders meeting in Nauru. Uh, we're going to launch a, uh, a dashboard for SDGs, and that will include SDG 6 to be able to look at progress across the region. So just to summarise, some of the issues that our member countries have told us are important, and we try to convey to development partners, is that if you're going to deal with water resource management and water and sanitation in the Pacific, you need to deal with generally these four areas. One is to protect the limited and fragile water resources that exist. And I think a few of the presenters so far have talked about that and some of the, the need to work uh, with communities, whether it be groundwater or rainwater, um, they are both limited and fragile and a lot needs to be done for their protection. The second is supporting small, isolated and sometimes informal communities because that's really where the main game is. Uh, that's where most water is managed. And in the Pacific, uh, the arms of, of national governments are often relatively short um, compared to the distances that are involved. The third is to help cope with limited human and financial resources. And we know that there is so much capacity in the Pacific uh, in terms of technical capacity, management capacity, but particularly in the smaller um, island countries, uh, we know that there's so much demand on that capacity um, that people often uh, wear multiple hats and those hats change very frequently. And finally, obviously, uh, the need to strengthen resilience to climate change and disasters through strengthening resilience to today's climate variability. And that's something that our member countries are doing quite a lot to demonstrate and hopefully share across the region. And maybe in a future webinar, we might have a chance to maybe share some of the solutions that uh, our members are putting in place. Okay, and uh, I hope uh, I hope I.
didn't cut out during that presentation. No, that was excellent. I, I think this was every bit as good as the, the version that we didn't hear. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, no, that was a really great presentation. I thought really just sort of connected the, the work that you're doing on the ground um, with sort of the, the, the data uh, and, and um, current trends that are happening. I thought that was really helpful to kind of contextualize all the things that are going on um, in the region. Um, well, we are right about at the time limit. So maybe if, if you need to go, if our panelists need to go or the audience needs to go, uh, I understand. Um, maybe we could have time for, for just one or two questions from our audience and then we'll, we'll wrap things up as quick as possible. Uh, would that work for everybody? Okay, great. Um, so one of the questions is that all the speakers have in some ways highlighted the high levels of uncertainty um, within water resources into the future. Um, um, societies and communities in comparison are typically seeking lower risk and uncertainty. And our, our question, uh, the audience member, Peter Lilly, would like to know more about the best science engineering understandings and solutions that can be effectively communicated to communities, um, including how to communicate uncertainty. Um, people want certainty, but we kind of, as, as scientists and as researchers, have to kind of communicate, well, sorry, the best uh, we can do is uncertainty. Um, so how can we get that information across so that communities can make informed decisions about their future? Uh, I'll leave the, the, the floor open and anyone can just respond as they as they want. I, I don't mind taking this. I love talking about uncertainty. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I, I think the most important thing is to keep emphasising that uncertainty is not debilitating. It doesn't mean that we don't have information. Um, it, it's just that there are probabilities associated with our information. And I, I do think that communities are changing so that they can think about probabilities a little bit more. You know, we understand what it means if our weather forecast says that there's a 50% chance of rain tomorrow. I think that we're getting better at dealing with those types of information. And so I think the best way we can communicate uncertainty is, is almost from a risk framework and, and just by saying, you know, here's the, the, the potential range of behaviours that we might see. This is, the, this is our, most likely, um, our most likely event, but there's also this probability that you could cross this threshold. And uh, so it's going to be a little bit context specific, but um, uh, you know I, I think the most important thing to keep emphasising is that uncertainty doesn't mean that we have lack of knowledge about things. Thank you. Is it, that was that that was that was important. That that's 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 a good way to communicate that and explain that to to our communities. Does anyone else want to have some uh, minute there? Go ahead and speak up. Take take yourself off mute uh, if you are on mute. So, out there in the in the Pacific, uh, amongst the islands, um, there's also certainly a lot of indigenous knowledge about how to deal with disaster. Um, I sometimes think. We, we perhaps do not do enough to understand what people out there understand, especially us in the academia. We try and try to... Are we okay? I hear all kinds of sounds. Um, people understand what is happening. I think what that question might come around to is the increase in, in the things that are going to go wrong in the future. Uh, the, the frequency of the of the events will increase. That's one kind of communication that I think people are beginning to get out there. It's a case of just how do what do they now do? And I think that's the part of where we need to really talk about simple solutions on the ground that they themselves can manage. So I think it is a case of understanding the uncertainty, Lucy. You spot on that we can actually just understand what the magnitude is because we'll have to adapt the simple solutions to that. Um, we simply cannot get to every community with, with kind of higher tech solutions. We need to, to come down and just have a look what our simple solutions are. I'll give you a small example. Maybe they are out there now, Dave, you will know better. But um, just taking groundwater out from, from an area just by pumping it with a solar-powered pump, for instance, and making water more consistently available to people as opposed to waiting 
for an event like a rainwater event or having to treat surface water at a higher cost at a higher technology um, that's one area of doing i know in africa we've tried all kinds of technologies and they're working quite well with the so-called sodas which means that just like the sunlight that you that you try and, 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 and disinfect the water by just heating or pasteurizing it little solutions like those um, that can be communicated. So resilience lying within the communication of what people know and what they can achieve. Um, yes, it, it, Scott, if I might add, add to that, yeah. to, to Paul, I'm glad you brought up sodas. It's, it's, we're actually just working on that this week with Kiribati. It's taking off all around Kiribati at the moment. It's a I think using the term sodas going viral is probably not appropriate, <laughs> but but it, it, it's certainly uh, it's certainly taking off around the around the islands uh, on its own now, and uh, and we know that uh, Kiribati gets uh, probably the most uh, solar radiation in the world, um, three times as much as Europe, twice as much as as uh, New Zealand. It works really well there. But I just wanted to give one very quick example about, in terms of dealing with uncertainty, one of the things we find is that there's a lot of uncertainty just because things aren't being measured. And we sometimes spend a lot of time trying to um, look at the global level or take global models and trying to downscale them, um, to apply them at a very local level. When at the, on the ground, sometimes the most simple measurements aren't being taken, like rainfall. Um, or groundwater. And an example we had in Vaitupu in Tuvalu just recently, where we helped do some local groundwater surveying. And uh, the great thing about that was that it, it actually, for the first time, uh, it uh, confirmed traditional knowledge in a way that it actually delineated it on a map and it gave it a number. So the traditional knowledge was already always there, but the community didn't have the, the actual basic data to be able to make decisions about exploiting it and now that the community has that information that they asked for with the SBC they're actually now going ahead and they're pressing uh, development partners to fund a development of that groundwater source to give them a lifeline against the drought so a great example of community taking ownership through being able to measure their own resource that's really good uh did anyone else have a some other uh, input or should we go on to the next question briefly okay we'll go on to the next question i'm going to combine the, the next two questions and sort of see if we can kind of put a spin on it here both questions are sort of focused on uh, best practices so anakin johnson asks if um you know in small communities where there's oil pollution what's the best possible remedy and anthony slater is asking um, what are the most successful interventions for small and informal communities to achieve the uh, sustainable development goal number six on water uh, at uh, water resources uh, at the local level? So I think both are kind of focused on best practices. So you can either respond by talking about the best practices that you know, or by critiquing the questions uh, uh, associated with or the assumptions around best practices um, and their implement, uh, implementation at the local level. So. Anyone want to jump in on that? Please just just uh, turn, take your microphone off mute and. Uh... I can't speak to to, to um, best practice for, for oil pollution, um, but regarding the second question regarding best practices of successful implementation of SDG six, um, I think what we've heard from some of the speakers uh, across the speakers today. This is the different scales that are, that are being operated at. There, there's the global sets, global scale of the SDGs, but then there's also the community scale. And um, from from my experience and experience here at GWI, is making sure that you have connection between the very high level um, political aspirations um, and, and targets, and then the buy-in and the application of the um, uh, indicators uh, at, at the ground level and having this engagement with what's happening on the ground and learning from the people that are actually facing these problems on the ground, I think is essential to that. And, and without having the uh, engagement and on the ground partnerships, um, then, then we're going to be facing a very long battle to try and achieve um, SDG 6, I think. Uh, the key message from me on that is that having the um, 
the, the high level agreements, but then brokering the partnerships and engagement at the ground level and working with the people that are actually facing these problems um, to uh, deliver safe and sustainable use of the water resources. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Uh, yes, Scott, I, I, I certainly agree with that. The local local solutions for local conditions is really important. And I think even if you look at the SDGs, whilst there have been a great improvement um, compared to the MDG targets uh, in terms of putting a little bit more about the environmental sustainability of the solution, we still know that a lot of development programs is, are really focused about um, bums on seats, I suppose is a way to put it. Um, and, and not always thinking about the environmental impact of sanitation. And in some places, particularly in the rural populations of Melanesia, we know that the SDG target is not going to be met. It, it's just not. So it's about risk minimization in that case and having uh, communities being able to take ownership of the issue, make the decisions in terms of behavioral change that they need to make which is just as important, if not more important, than the infrastructure changes that need to be in place. So uh, in many cases, those uh, solutions are homegrown. So it's a, um, a matter of listening to communities and helping uh, with all the potential resources coming into the region for, um, for climate uh, change adaptation to ensure that some of that actually goes to, or a good proportion goes to supporting communities doing work on the ground. That's a good, really good way to frame the question and frame, frame the, the, the idea because I think there's a lot of concern and critique about, okay, well, the SDGs won't be met. Well, it's not just a completely lost opportunity, but it's about you know, how do we adapt to this reality that we won't quite achieve them and how can we keep going to make that progress? So that's good input. Thank you. Um, I think we are here about the end of the questions and we are a little bit over time anyway. So I'm going to give everyone a chance to make one last quick statement just to sum up your, your top of your thoughts um, and then we will sign off. Uh, I will start in the order that we originally had planned for the webinar um, before we had some disconnections. So Professor uh, Dancy. Doctor. Hey, it's not. Doctor. I should point out, yes, yes, uh, not, not Professor. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Scott, and thank you to the panelists and, and the audience for, for uh, engaging. I found it a fascinating um, discussion. Um, and, and from my side, um, the, the take home message is that listening from what we've heard today, um, that operating at both the, um, from the engineering science point of view, also the community engagement and buy in side of things. There's challenges um, and opportunities um, that we're facing today that are very, very similar to what we've you know, set at this arbitrary 2025 date. I think Oceana is uh, already um, uh, grappling uh, with, with uh, climate change issues more than other parts of the world. And I think the solutions developed now with the climate vari variability um, will put in good stead solutions for the severe impacts of climate change that are expected. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amelia Tabuchi. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you uh, to the panelists and um, for this opportunity. Uh, I think from uh, my side, um, there's always opportunity, there's always uh, a way forward for uh, everybody, particularly from, uh, from our perspective, from the environmental health services. There is uh, still hope and uh, I'm thankful for this opportunity, given that we are able to look forward to future collaboration and uh, uh, communications uh, partnership in the future, particularly in developing WASH, uh, not only for uh, Fiji, but the Pacific, and also opportunities to learn new things, opportunities to share and uh, learn from uh, each other. Particularly, I'm thankful for the for bringing up the issue of uh, traditional knowledge. You know, uh, the skills that uh, still exist. That's also something that would actually help most in uh, sharing. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's from me. Thank you, uh, Professor Paul Jangles. Um, thank you, S Scott. Just the Fiji National University is embarking on on quite a a new set of programs in terms of teaching research is following out on the heels of that and thanks to working with Andrew 
over a short period of time so far, and that, that will continue into the chapter work on the water side, but there are also other areas in environmental health, as Amelia has pointed out earlier. By the way, for the just to put in perspective, Amelia and I are colleagues at the Fiji National University, and we develop these programs together. And we are bringing in what we know of what's happening out there so that the next generation of people that go out and serve us, like the officers, would know what goes on but also to upskill people as well as current working officers in the field as to what is needed to be done. I think the mantra here, as David, is, is in, a, in a sense that meeting SDGs and especially SDG 6, but there are others that are so closely related, is, uh, is important. I think we all strive towards that, but I think just addressing them to begin with, to get going. And I was very happy to hear about the dashboard idea that you were that you uh, spoke about a little earlier. So from our side, from the FNU, we we aim to play a major role in this chapter. So Andrew also was playing a role with the Global Water um, Institute, but uh, the bringing in the knowledge and capacitating communities would be the mantra for us for the moment. We we'll leave the research to the researchers out there that will be our partners in this game, and the implementers on the ground. SPC, thank you very much so far as well. So, Chair, over back to you. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Dave Hebbelwith? Mm. Uh, yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, I, I think the main take-home message I got from this is actually just meeting uh, partners working in the field that have such interesting stories. I could actually spend a lot more time talk, talking and hearing from, from you all um, and noting that there's several of you that I have never met before. So the Samoa pathway, um, the, the SIDS pathway actually said that the sustainable development in, in small island developing states could only be achieved through partnerships with government, um, civil society and other organisations. And I just think it shows there's so much good work happening out there at all those levels. And um, so forums like this are excellent to get as many people together to share their um, examples of success. And, uh, and challenges as well. It's, uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Assistant Prof Associate Professor Lucy Marshall. Yeah, I, I will echo everyone's comments on, on the importance of partnerships. And, uh, you know, I, I think what has been brought forward is, is also the importance of diversity of knowledge. And so ensuring that to make things really innovative, that we have partnerships between researchers, scientists, community organisations, Indigenous people, um, so that we have a full perspective of, of the problems that we're tackling. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for everybody in my panel for joining us here today. Um, I know that some of the panel and IWRA is all on Twitter. So if you're in the audience and you want to follow them, go ahead and look us up and uh, give us a follow. Um, you know, people in the audience, if the um, presentations left you really interested in learning more, you can follow up with this and continue engaging on our LinkedIn web page. So you can go to LinkedIn, search IWRA and uh, continue the discussion, continue the debate. Um, as a quick reminder, we are going to get a recording of this as well as the PDFs up on our website. So if you want to rewatch this, you want to share it with your colleagues, or if you want to look into some of the presentations a little more, uh, please feel free to go on our webpage. Give us a few days, but we'll have it there. Um, I also want to remind everyone that, uh, you know, just as we were discussing here, this has been a really great exchange and networking opportunity. So if you are in the Oceana region, please um, feel free to reach out and join the Oceana um, IWA regional chapter um, where you can continue this discussion, continue this networking, continue having this exchange of ideas. Um, if you're not in the Oceana region um, and you want to start your own regional chapter, please reach out to IWRA and we can maybe facilitate that. We'd love to see that happen as well. We'd love to grow the uh, reach of our regional chapters. So um, thank you really everyone for joining us here today. Um, this has been a really great experience for everybody, I think. Um, just to remind you, everyone in the audience, that the webinar is brought to you by the International Water Resources Association. We're an over 40-year-old nonprofit, non-governmental educational organization. We focus on bridging disciplines and geographies and connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations, institutions. Everyone who's concerned with the sustainable use of the water, or world's water resources. So if you want to know more about the association, you want to see our webinars again, and you want to become a member, please go to www.iwra.org. So, uh, Bula, I think as they say, and uh, thank you uh, on behalf of the whole IWRA office and the Ocean Chapter for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.
Thanks, Scott. Thanks.